Well, I mean, I hate to burst your bubble, but uh, I've never had a shark tooth necklace. Oh, ne what? You can't believe the stuff you read in the media. <laughs> what? So what teeth were we working with? Oh, uh, well, there's some antlers or uh, antlers on there, some ivory elk teeth, some buffalo teeth, some mountain lion claws, bear claws, turkey spurs, but no shark teeth. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Mets Pod. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, joined as always by my co host, Joe DeMeo. And you notice a special guest on with us, Turk Wendell. Turk, thanks so much for the time. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good, gentlemen. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. So, Turk is obviously here to talk Mets past and present, in addition to some really cool Mets events that are coming up. And we'll get into all of that on the upcoming weekend. Uh, but, Turk, I got to be honest, I, I heard we got you coming on. I stepped up my game, my shark tooth necklace game with a, a little shark tooth necklace. And I, number one, how'd I do, Turk? Okay. Is this past the test? You did. Well, I mean, I hate to burst your bubble, but uh, I've never had a shark tooth necklace. Oh, ne what? You can't believe the stuff you read in the media. <laughs> what, so, what teeth were we working with? Uh, well, there's some antlers or uh, antlers on there, some ivory elk teeth, some buffalo teeth, some mountain lion claws, bear claws, turkey spurs, but no shark teeth. Turk, next time you're on, I promise I will up my game. Only if I <laughs> gather uh, the necklace belongings myself. So let me ask you this. We know we, we read everything and watched everything with Taiwan Walker last year. Which Met this year do you think can respectably wear some of the necklaces that you wore throughout your time pitching for the team? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't think Max would wear something like that. But I, just, pick, I, mean, I mean, it's... I really enjoy watching him pitch. I love watching Verlander pitch. I always have. I love watching both of them. I mean, I think they are the ultimate competitors uh, for starting pitchers. They're definitely a dying breed. Um, and watching DeGrom, unfortunately, he's not with the Mets anymore. Um, but they just take their game to another level. And the thing, and I talked to Max briefly about it last year, that I just love his mentality when it's his day to pitch. It's his game. No one else is pitching. It's my game. And everybody just sit back and watch. And he's just got that killer mentality. And I think the pitch clock, as dumb as I think it is, I think that's going to help him a lot. We have to ask you about Edwin Diaz, obviously, having the unfortunate injury at the World Baseball Classic. Uh, what was your reaction to the injury when you saw it happen? And how do you think the Mets move forward with their bullpen? Well, it's definitely going to be a tough hole to fill, a huge, huge uh, hole. I think they can do it. Um, I, I hope that they can figure out a person, not bullpen by committee, because I don't think that ever really is successful unless you say uh, each day you're the closer. Because if they if they do the bullpen by committee uh, every day and no one, nobody knows who has the ninth inning, then every time the phone rings from the first inning to the ninth inning, so be it, every guy down there, their heart starts beating fast when the phone rings, so they don't know who it is. And I, I've taken some, I wouldn't say slack, but people don't quite understand it when I've said in the past that closing is the easiest job in the bullpen. And most people go, what? I mean, if you don't want to pitch when the game's on the line, you shouldn't be pitching. But the game dictates whether you're going to pitch or not. And you don't get a lot of the dry humps, as we call them, where you get up and sit down, get up, sit down, get up, sit down during the course of, say, the fifth inning to the eighth inning. You know, they, like I said, the game dictates whether you're going to get in there or not. And as a closer, if you hadn't pitched in a few days, you they'll call down and say, hey, you want to get an innings worth of work in? Or they'll say, hey, we're going to get you an inning tonight. Stay sharp. Um, so there's not that wear and tear on your arm. But, uh, you know, watching Edwin, and it was just a really unfortunate deal because it wasn't some huge hog pile, dog pile celebration. It was just doing what everybody usually does acts like little kids jumping up and down for whatever reason. I've never understood it, but I've done it too. <laughs> it's human um, instinct. Yeah, I think it is. It is. And it's actually, to me, it's a little safer than the dog pile thing because I've always said, I mean, everybody's got spikes on and you're getting dog piled. You might break a rib. Who knows what could happen? But, you know, that was just a simple, honest little celebration, nothing crazy. And that was just super unfortunate. And I feel bad for Edwin. He's such a good dude. And 
I hope uh, I hope he comes back, uh, you know, 100 percent, and <clears throat> he doesn't have any lingering effects from this. So we wanted to ask you about Amazing Day. This Saturday, March 25th, Mets fans can wear their hats to unlock access to various experience and iconic locations in New York City. There's also an Amazing Day sweepstakes for people who cannot participate in person where the grand prize winner will get to throw out the first pitch at City Field. All you need to know, including information about merchandise pop-ups, can be found at Mets.com slash Amazing Day. Turk, tell us about what you and a long list of other Mets alumni uh, we'll be doing during these events this Saturday. Well, we're going to be going to, I, I'm going to two different parks throughout the day in the city. And I don't actually know exactly what my role will be other than just getting people fired up for opening day and, and, awesome. and Mets baseball. And I know that I'm going to the Gotham Comedy Club uh, Saturday night from at least 7.30 to 8.30 <clears throat> or probably later on, imagine, because I usually when I do these events, I have so much fun just as much as the fans do that I end up staying longer than I have to. That's awesome. Great stuff. And reminder, get all your info about Mets Amazing Day at Mets.com slash Amazing Day. You kind of briefly mentioned the pitch clock, and I think I know where this answer is going to be headed. Uh, so we wanted to ask you about the pitch clock, and we tried one on, we tried one on this show. I am known for being very long-winded, so... Our producer, Jeff, I think just wanted a shorter show, so he put me on the pitch clock for my answers. Uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on the pitch clock just overall, and how would it have affected you back in the day? Well, it, it, I was, I'm was i a guy like Max. I get the ball and yeah. I want to go. I, I, yeah. I don't want to get out there and screw around and dilly-dally. I like to get, get it done. Um, you know, as a whole, I think I don't understand why they keep screwing with the game of baseball. It's been around – 150 some odd years or more, you know, you're trying to fix a game that's not broken and the bases and bigger bases, no shift guy on second, extra innings. I, I just, I mean, and the games, I'm not just saying it's come pitcher, but it, it was a pitcher. It's built around offense. I don't know a true baseball fan that absolutely loves baseball that says, well, I want it done in two hours and 20 minutes. Um, they want to see a good baseball game and occasionally maybe a blowout when the team they cheer for wins. But for some way, shape, or form, people have gotten to this idea that they want to see a 15 to 12 game with nine home runs, but they don't want to sit there for four hours. And so they want the games to get over. But you look at the cost of going to a ball game. Family of four costs four or five hundred dollars to a game. Well, now if the game gets over within two hours, people are going to be going, well, what the hell? I just spent seven hundred dollars and I'm not getting my money's worth. So I don't get it. I yeah. mean baseball has been one of the most beautiful games and I think it is the, the best game ever invented. And it was the only game that wasn't timed. And now they're trying to institute time into it, which, you know, you take a lot of the strategy out of the game. Uh, and now with, you know, instituting DH in both leagues, there's a lot, not a whole lot of strategy involved where you're pitching around guys to get to the pitcher for double switches and that kind of stuff. So it, it, it's almost, I, mean, I used to joke around saying American League was the beer league because of that DH and it was like, you know, home run derby. But I mean, that's just because there was not a whole lot of strategy. You don't see guys bunting guys over. And uh, ironically, was I think it was last year, the Braves hadn't had a sacrifice bunt the entire season until I think the last two or three days of the season. And then next thing you know, it's playoffs and they got to get guys over and the guys are bunting and they're going, what the hell? I've never, I haven't bunted all year. So it's just, uh, you know, the no shift thing, guys come up to the minor leagues and you have to go the other way. So I don't understand why guys don't try to bunt the other way, slap the ball the other way. Uh, I don't know if it's an ego thing where I'm going to beat the shift or I'm going to hit a home run and just screw your shift. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you're a team player and you should get on base for the next guy and have him do his job. But those are my own, you know, just my opinions. And we know what opinions are like, right? <laughs> I've said this from the time they started telling us as relievers that we had so many seconds to get in out of the bullpen, trying to speed the game up. There's one simple solution to me if you want to speed the game up, but people don't want it because they want offense. Make the umpires call the strike that's in the rule book a strike from your armpits to your kneecaps. The game will speed up on its own because guys will not be sitting there being super selective. They're going to swing the bat and the game's going to move along. Yeah, we're with you on that, especially in this era where you can 
go back and look at how many they miss or how many, not even, we can't even call it a miss. They just don't call certain pitches a strike that is in the strike zone. So uh, it's something that definitely aggravates baseball fans consistently. Turk, we know New York fans, they gravitate towards personality. I mean, we are New York fans and we always gravitate towards personality, which is why you were so popular here. Does it take a special kind of athlete to succeed in New York City, whether it's the fan and media pressure or just the uh, how much eyes are on the teams all the time, the New York rivalry. Does it take a different kind of athlete to really play here for a long time? Oh, I think it does. It, it definitely does. And it takes a kind of a, um, I don't know what the word would be, like a, kind of a no shit athlete, you know, yeah. you don't take any shit kind of deal. Um, for me, it was just kind of, I am who I am. And you guys are going to get everything I got every single day. And you know what? If I suck today, I'm going to tell you I suck today. You don't have to tell me I sucked because I know I sucked. But I tell you what, I'm going to work my ass off to be better for you tomorrow. And, you know, the things that motivated me every single day to keep working hard to be the best player I could be because I didn't want to let my teammates down. I didn't want to let my the fans down. I didn't want to let myself down. Um, and those are the things that, that helped me be the player I was. And, you know, I guess my personality um, – came out because I, I had more days where I did well and didn't suck. I mean, if I sucked, I probably wouldn't have been in New York that long. But coming from um, up through the systems as a Brave player, uh, being around the big leagues, um, big league team with the Braves in spring training, and then going to Chicago, playing in Chicago, a big city, big market, and then going to the Mets, and then going to the Phillies, another big market city. And then I like a dumbass, basically committed career suicide by signing with the Rockies. Uh, great place to play. Great I place to live. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I lived there in the off season. Yeah. So it was, you know, hometown discount to play there. And, but it, not only career wise, was it bad for me as a pitcher playing in Coors Field, but it's the fans is just a different atmosphere out there. It was a huge social event and it wasn't a huge deal if you lost. And it took a lot of the oomph out of it to keep pushing myself every single day. I mean, hell, in Philadelphia, if we lost, I'd walk out of there with a flak jacket if I gave up the homer and lost the game. And that really helps you become a better player. It really pushes you to be a better player. And the guys that just kind of go through the motions and, you know, the lallygaggers, if you would, if you would um, Met fans see through that shit. And, you know, that's why they ran guys like Mel Rojas out of town, Bobby Bonilla. If, if you're not giving it your all, they they can tell and they'll let you know about it. When fans think back to the 99-2000 teams, they think of the stars like Piazza and Ventura and, and guys like that. I like to think back to the, you know, maybe under the radar guys, guys like you, guys like Benny Agbayani, guys like Timo Perez. Uh, who do you think was the most underrated or maybe publicly underappreciated member of those teams you know not just because he's one of my best friends but rick reed uh, always yeah. the poor man's maddox you yeah. know or because he was a replacement player he gets a bad rap for that but you know everyone's got a story and everybody would have done exactly what he did for his family for his mom who was sick um and, and it's just sad that they keep talking about that i mean you, you know rick reed's a great human being and you know, I don't even know why I should say this, but, you know, Kevin Millar was absolutely, he was a great player too, but he was also a replacement player. And now look at him. No one talks about that ever. <laughs> so it's kind of ironic that he's got this great show and he's had an unbelievable post career in baseball and, in you know, uh, w within the sports world. But, uh, you know, Rick Reed was just a guy that went out there every single day, nose to the grindstone um won some big games hell he won our only game we won in the world series in 2000 turk we know it's been a big off season of headlines for the mets money spent for the mets and and with all that comes expectations what is your outlook for the team this year with all those expectations but of course with a lot of talent on this roster and of course on the starting rotation now no oh, i i i'm a huge mets fan now i mean i grew up a red Sox fan and I still watch the Red Sox, but I'd find myself watching the Mets over the Red Sox if I had a choice, for sure. Um, it's just great being a part of the Mets still and getting to know the Cones. I mean, the fact that they're fans, 
really ups it to a whole nother level because they want to win and and have being a player and knowing that the, the owners want to do whatever it takes i mean and they're just great people i got to know them last summer doing some stuff for the mets i mean it's just his wife goes around and gives out tickets to during the game to upgrade people's seats she personally does it and i did it with her one night goes up to the to the upper deck and says hey you guys want to upgrade to watch the game behind home plate and the people look at him like are you kidding kidding me and it's food and food and drinks for the rest of the game I mean, one lady was crying she was so excited for her and her kids i mean what owners do that kind of stuff and and as a player and i'm, you know, I'm not sure any of the players current players see that but they just take pride in, in what they're doing and as fans they want to win and uh you know it really does help that he's got some very very deep pockets to get the best players but as the yankees well know you can't buy a championship and you can't buy that team chemistry um a lot of times when you get too many superstars on one team i think uh it's a kiss of death and obviously not being ever on a yankee team thank god um <laughs> they love that so much <laughs> that's great um well it's just i sometimes i think you have too many too many egos maybe and that might be too harsh of a word to say egos wise because i'm sure a lot of you know they're just great people but very competitive but i've said it so many times and people have asked me what made the 2099 team so good we really only had mike as a piazza as a superstar player but nobody cared who got the glory who was a superstar as long as he won the game and you know that was that was all that mattered who you know if ray ordonius was a hero today or rick reed or benny agbayani that was awesome and you know we won today and that's all that matters winning today and we'll deal with tomorrow and so many things from i can't remember it kind of goes to, in a blur now maybe because i'm getting old um I don't know if it was 99 or it was the 2000 season. I think it was 99 when they fired pretty much the entire coaching staff other than Bobby Valentine before the All-Star break. And then we come back and make the playoffs and, you know, we're one win from going to the World Series in 99. Um, it just shows the resilience of the team, uh, how close we were, the bond, you know, chemistry and the bond that we had. And, uh, you know, it, it's a huge tribute to how great a manager Bobby Valentine was. Um, I loved him as a manager. I thought he was just awesome. I mean, he told everybody the role. Opening day, he'd walk around, tell everyone, this is my role. I'm sorry, this is your role. He would tell me, you're my guy. From the sixth inning on, up or down by three. You'll never pitch before the sixth inning. And just knowing that, I mean, it's your job as a player to accept your role and be the best you can at it. Um, when there's lack of communication, that's when things get kind of messy, I think. And that's what I was getting to, alluding to when I was talking about closure by committee. I don't know of any closure by committee that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, a team that's had that, that's been very successful. And today's game, because pitchers don't go deep in games anymore, bullpens are the, they're the freaking core of your team. Yeah. I mean, those are the teams that usually are winning World Series probably in the last – you know, 15 to 20 years, it's been the, the bullpen. The teams with the best bullpen win. So you mentioned all the things that the Coens are doing. And one of the big ones for me was Old Timers Day, which I was able to go to last year. It was so awesome to see everything happening around there. How great was that experience for you to catch up with maybe some old teammates you hadn't talked to in many years? Because I'm sure you lose touch with some of them and, you know, meet some former Mets that you didn't know. Oh, it was awesome. Um, you know, getting to talk to Pedro Martinez, playing catch with him. I, I didn't know him before that, of course, being a Red Sox fan, watching him, um, playing against him and stuff like that, uh, just getting to know him on a different level. And I meant to ask Jay, Jay Horowitz. I actually talked to him this morning. I mean, how often are they going to have this old timers game? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I do. It, I would do it every year, but, uh, I was a little disappointed. I only got to throw one batter last year, though. That kind of sucked. I was working <laughs> out, getting ready for that. <laughs> they had uh, pitch count, strict pitch yeah. count. But it was cool getting to know and, and meeting players that from you know later on or earlier on that I'd heard about. And I was fortunate to know uh, Tom Seaver before he passed away by doing stuff with the Mets or he came to spring training. But, uh, you know, just 
the lore of some of the older players that you never, you know, they were well, well before my time. And, and sadly enough, some players, I didn't know who they were. Um, yeah, there was, it, I don't know how they decide who was there or whatnot, or if they're going to have it or how often they're going to have it. But, you know, there was a few guys that I thought maybe could have been there that, that weren't there, like a Rick Reed, like I said. Um, but that's just, you know, players, some players from my era, but you're talking from a long time. Plus, some guys can't even play in the game. Right. All right, I got to close out with this one. If you were still pitching today and you had to have a walkout song, Turk, what are you what are you walking out to? <laughs> well, I'm not a big movie buff, so um, uh, geez, I'm a country guy. Okay. Um, and I consider Iowa God's country, but on the baseball field, I would consider New York God's country, so I would have to say Blake Shelton's God's country. There we go. We got it. Turk, they might be calling you at this point, Turk. If this closer by yeah, committee man. doesn't work out, we <laughs> I can mean, give you at least three or four innings once a week. There we go. We might be hearing it at City <laughs> I don't Field. Know if at I could tow it up every day like I did in the past, <laughs> but I still throw a lot. My son plays for the Diamondbacks in the minors. Yeah. So I play a lot of catch with him and stuff. But uh, yeah, a couple, two days in a row, and I'm like, yeah, a little achy in the next couple of days. <laughs> Man, that's so awesome. And it was so awesome talking to you, Turk. I mean, really, just stories for days um, about baseball. And, and we love your thoughts on the game and where it's going and where it's been. So we really appreciate your time today. Well, I appreciate it, fellas. Anytime you want to chat some more, let me know. I mean, I, I can ramble on. I know that. <laughs> we'll definitely do it again soon. Turk Wendell, thank you so much. All right, guys. Thanks. Awesome catching up with Turk Wendell, uh, Joe. I feel like we could listen to him tell stories about the teams he played on. Mets baseball. It's so cool how involved he still is with the organization. And a reminder to check out Mets.com slash Amazing Day for all the info about Saturday, March 25th, and your chance to catch up with Turk. A lot of other Mets alumni that will be there as well. And here's your weekly reminder to subscribe to the Mets pod, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMY's YouTube, or wherever you get your shows. Some good news, Joe. We were both very pleasantly surprised by this. Brandon Nimmo might be on track for opening day. I, when we first watched it, you assume the worst. Then you hear the diagnosis, and you're like, okay, May on a good timeline. And I call me crazy. Out of nowhere, when I saw gearing up to play the Mets' last couple uh, Grapefruit League games and be ready for opening day. I mean, we know Nimmo's a guy that pushes it. He hates being hurt. He's dealt with injuries. But this this would be really big news for the Mets if their center fielder is ready to roll. We're due some good luck. So um, a, a yeah, lot more yeah. than just this. Yeah. Yes, a lot more than this. But yeah, obviously, when we saw what happened in Nemo, that was very concerning. Um, you know, you and I had texted about kind of what we thought based on your football knowledge and yeah. us just playing doctor for fun. Uh, but yeah, not on like Twitter, said, only in text. Just yeah. to be safe. What when you hear week to week, you don't assume that means under a week or just about a week that he'll be back. You assume that means multiple weeks. So it's a good thing that it seems like things are checking out in his workouts on the field, um, getting ground ball, uh, fly balls, not ground balls, getting fly balls, running the bases. And uh, Buck said on Wednesday morning that they'll see how the next couple days go. But like you said, Connor, they're hoping to get him into grapefruit league action for the last couple games before spring training is over and we're on to opening day. So, all good signs. Seems like Brandon Nemo is trending in the direction of uh, being their opening day. Because I didn't really want to think of what they were going to do in the outfield if Nemo was to miss some real time. It's kind of what comes to mind, right? You look at the Mets as constructed. I know people will bang the drum for Marte to take over center field if you lose Nemo. I mean, the Mets are very hesitant and, and reluctant to do that, especially coming off an offseason surgery. So it just kind of shows you how vital he is to this team. It's why they gave him the contract that they did. He's a player they simply cannot lose for an extended period of time, and it's all looking promising for Nimmo. And, and let's get into a little opening day roster talk. I mean, the talk of our uh, late winter spring, Joe, has been Brett Beatty. I think it's crunch time right now. I, I mean, we've even heard Eric Chavez kind of go to bat about Beatty's defense, and we know Beatty has just hit the cover off the ball the entire spring. What are your thoughts on how this roster ultimately shakes out? And are we safely calling Beatty a lock at this point? I I will believe it when I see it. I think Brett yeah. Beatty should be the opening day third baseman. And they asked Eduardo Escobar if he thinks he's the starter. And he said, I don't know. So 
I do think there is momentum in Beatty's direction. I mean, it's obvious that, like you said, he's tearing the cover off the ball. I think he still leads uh, all of baseball and batting average this spring and second in on base percentage, or maybe those are flipped. But either way, he's at the top on two of the most important hitting categories that there are. And Eric Chavez has talked about his defense. He told us on this show last week that it's just confidence and belief in himself. And you're starting to see that throughout the spring where he's making those splash plays. He's getting a little more consistent out there and looking like a big league third baseman. So to me, I don't know how they can justify not having Beatty on the opening day roster. I'd be very interested to hear what the quotes would be from Billy Epler and in Buck Showalter if they you know, send Beatty down the AAA here in the next week. To me, he should be on the team. Um, as far as other battles, it's, to me, it's it's mostly in the bullpen, right? I yeah. mean, Sam Coonrod's down with an injury. Obviously, they're without Edwin Diaz for a while. Bryce Montes de Oak is hurt. Uh, that opens the door for a guy like John Curtis, who uh, got hit a little bit in his last outing, but he's been fantastic all spring. And one guy that I think has a really, really good chance to make this opening day roster that I feel like you and I kind of haven't talked about a ton over spring training. Like Tommy Hunter's just getting everybody out. Yes. Like he's just coming in. And uh, I think Tommy Hunter stands a really strong chance of making this bullpen. Uh, one thing I'll be interested to see as well is regards to the rotation. I think David Peterson has the leg up on McGill for that last spot. But the question will be based on off days and stuff that you have early on in the season, like they have the off day after opening day and they'll have the off day after the home opener. Do they need a fifth starter the first time through? So is it possible that Peterson doesn't make the opening day roster, quote, but gets called up, you know, a week later or whatever when they need a fifth starter? Uh, so, yeah, in general, I think the roster is mostly set. Just a couple things that need to be figured out. Most importantly, Brett Beatty. Yeah, well, the only note we really have on Beatty, uh, John Heyman tweeted in the middle of the week, you know, when the Mets sent down Francisco Alvarez, he said Brett Beatty remains in camp. He's having a great spring, but probably still is an uphill battle to make the opening why? Of the roster. I, I, that yeah. would be my first, like, why? Why is there an uphill? If What were you expecting him to do? Hit hit 900? I, I mean, honestly, yeah. like, I, and sure, they're making the defensive case, but I don't really know how the defensive case holds up when you have quotes from Eric Chavez, like, he's a big league third baseman. There's not even a question in my mind. I, yeah. So, I mean, maybe, and also... People just don't know. And the Mets also want to delicately uh, deliver this news to guys like Escobar because that, you know, obviously he's a leader of the clubhouse, a veteran respected. Maybe we're kind of overthinking it, but we'll see. And to your point on Tommy Hunter, it's wild how little anybody ever talks about him. I, I mean, throughout his two-year Mets tenure right now, he has 22 appearances and a 178 ERA. Like, it, it, we know Tommy Hunter can pitch and pitch extremely effectively. If he stays healthy... And gives you, I mean, Joe, if he gives you over 30 appearances, that that's a giant win for Tommy Hunter, who's had health problems, because he's been a really good reliever for a long, long time in this league. And it's just a matter of ultimately staying healthy. So we'll see uh, where that goes. And that's that would be a big help for the bullpen, because we constantly talk about with the Diaz injury, it bumps everybody up a spot. And that leaves the cupboard a little bare in the sixth inning kind of role. So, or, or at least you're looking around for guys to step up and help. So we'll see where this goes. It's going to be a fascinating uh, crunch time decision for the Mets. But Joe, I think if you ask you or I, it's not really interesting at all. It's just that Brett Beatty needs to be on this team and they're only hurting the potential of this offense being potent again, if he's not. Yeah, and Eduardo Escobar could fill another role. I mean, he could be the right-handed DH. Like, if they're not satisfied they don't have one. with... Yeah, they don't have one. Darren Ruff still hasn't shown much in spring. I don't know if they'll... You know, maybe it's an IL situation because I know the wrist has kind of, like, barked on him a couple times this spring. So maybe they can IL him to start the year. I think Mark Vientos has impressed some this spring, but I don't see him as a really strong candidate to make the opening day roster. It feels like it's a Vientos or Beatty thing, right? Like, I don't think you can pull off having Beatty as the third baseman and Mark Vientos as the right-handed DH because then you have Escobar and Guillaume, like, two backup utility infielders. It doesn't feel like good roster construction, at least for opening day. So, to me, Beatty should be the third baseman. Escobar could take some uh, 
right-handed DH reps or even spell Beatty against maybe a really tough lefty. Uh, he can play some second base. You saw him in left field for the WBC and with the Mets. So I think Escobar has a little flexibility, but to me, and I've been saying it for weeks, and I mean, maybe it'll have the same outcome that it was us talking about calling up Mark Vientos for weeks last year, and it just never happened. Maybe all these cries are for nothing and uh, Beatty will start in AAA Syracuse, but I think he has done everything humanly possible to earn a spot on the opening day roster. And I want to see the Mets be rewarding guys for earning jobs. If you're the Mets, you can't ask for a better scenario after what happened with Carlos Correa, that Beatty come, you're looking for more offense and you're kind of reaching under every couch cushion of, well, where can we get it? Right? Because we spent a lot of our money on pitching. We think that, we think that guys will be healthy and have big years. Obviously, Lindor, Pete, McNeil, hopefully Nimmo, hopefully Marte, hopefully Canna. But you want more offense. A lot of those guys were good last year. Where are you getting more? And Escobar, as we talked about, really bookended his season. He had the hot month to start the season. He had the scorcher to end the season. From May or June through August, he was borderline unplayable. Honestly, and I know it's harsh, but when you just look at the numbers, so, so that's the clear, like it's right in front of you where you're like, wow, we have this young guy that we used the first round pick on that can give us maybe 20 to 25 home runs and maybe hit 280. You don't, you don't know. There's a good chance with, you know, gap to gap power. So it, it's going to be a big storyline and it has been. That's why we talk about it on every show because it's what everybody wants to discuss. But we will move to the mailbag section because we got a lot of good questions here, Joe. Uh, that I don't want to short the ones that we picked out. Of course, Steve Miller. We haven't had Steve Miller's questions on the show in a while. Got to get Steve here. And he said, has Francisco Alvarez struggling at the plate this spring surprised you, or is it not that big of a deal? Both, right? Like, I'm kind of surprised that Francisco Alvarez hit 100 or just over 100 because he's just been such a great hitter ever since turning pro. Um, but it's also not that big of a deal. It's just spring training. Um, they basically made the bed that Alvarez wasn't going to be on this team when they signed Omar Narvaez. The reality was that meant Alvarez was just not starting the year with the big league team. And, you know, not like Beatty, I think Alvarez benefits from that AAA time of going down there and catching guys like, and he'll catch big league type arms too. Like Tyler McGill should be there. Joey Lucchese should be there. Eliezer Hernandez. Some yeah. of these relief, some of these relievers that, uh, have options that aren't going to make the team that have big league experience. I think that's going to be a benefit for someone like Alvarez. So yeah, not a huge deal. I wish he hit like Beatty and Vientos and Mauricio did. I think that would have been uh, more fun for us to talk about, but let the top catching prospect and top five prospect in the sport go under the radar. Perfectly cool with that. We'll see him uh, potentially soon enough, depending on what happens with Narvaez and Nito this year. And you'll, you'll see plenty of Alvarez going forward. Yeah, we often forget how little experience Alvarez got in AAA that him having, and he also struggled a little bit in AAA. So mm -hmm. it's a scenario where the guy needs seasoning. He's a really, really young prospect. And the Mets, fortunately, in this ownership era, have built an infrastructure that they allow guys to develop at a proper pace rather than having to serve. You see a lot of these organizations, I mean, they're looking for saviors because they don't spend any money. And they call up these guys and I'm not, the Braves obviously are different. You know, it, it's worked out really well for them. I'm not talking about the Braves and they've won a lot. I'm talking about the organizations that don't win the Reds and the Pirates kind of come to mind where they're, they have these young guys up and Hey, it's like, figure it out. And if you're bad, you're bad. We're always bad too. So it doesn't really matter. The Mets aren't operating that way anymore, where if a guy comes up and needs to play every day and is bad, they don't have that patience because the Mets are projected to be really good where, Hey, marinate a little bit in the minors, get right. And when we call you up, you're going to be an impact player, which quietly whisper. This also helps with service time. It's not the worst thing in the world to not having to be dealing with a star hitting free agency at 26 or 27, because you rushed him when he wasn't really productive in his first couple of major league seasons. So the Alvarez thing isn't a big deal. Uh, it's kind of the exact opposite of Beatty, where we're like, he's ready, get him up here, like, don't waste any time, service time doesn't matter. So another question here from Dan B, he said, do people realistically think Epler would trade for Alexis Diaz enough that someone would ask the Reds GM? And, you know, Joe, my initial thoughts are, and I'd love yours on this, 
or right before opening day, teams are not going to trade high end relievers and or closers because that is telling their clubhouse. We don't believe in this year at all. The, on the counter, you get to the trade deadline. As soon as a team is out in the standings, the first thing they put on the block is their closer and setup man. So the Mets yep. are in a situation that we keep kind of hammering the table. They got to tread water. They got to keep their heads above water with the end of the bullpen. And when we get to the deadline, they'll make a move. And everyone wants just an uh, immediate reaction. And the worst organizations in general are reactionary ones. So they lost Diaz. Okay, so they call uh, Nick Crowell over in Cincinnati for Alexis Diaz, who has five years of control, by the way. So while the Reds, you know, we kind of rag on the Reds a lot on this podcast. Uh, it's very like the, random. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the skyline chili that bothers me. I think so. So we're, we're just out on the Reds. But the reality, it, the reality is like, even if they're not contending now, they are building up like an infrastructure through their farm system. So selling a closer with that much uh, time left isn't always the best decision. And you know the Mets need it. So you're going to charge $3 on on the dollar for it. Like the, they're going to say, you want Alexis Diaz? We want Brett Beatty. Yes. And then the Mets just say no, and we all move on with our day. So uh, it's a good dream. And I know Edwin has said he wants the one-day pitch with Alexis, and I assume Alexis wants the one-day pitch with Edwin. And maybe that comes to fruition at some point down the road. But the Mets need David Robertson, Adam Ottavino, Brooks Raley, Drew Smith, and the other guys in this bullpen to step up and try to collectively fill the shoes lost by Diaz. Um, not – not like what like Turk said before, no closer by committee. We don't we yeah. don't necessarily want to do that, but everyone needs to step up because now you don't have that that buffer at the end of the game. You're now going to Robertson, who has you know plenty of experience closing. I, I think he's gonna be just fine. And I don't think the Mets need to overreact because it's just opening day. Like it's exciting. We're all excited for baseball to start, but the opening day roster. Go look at opening day rosters over the last handful of years and then look how the team ended up like four months later. It's night and day. So I think we at times do overrate what the opening day roster particularly is and means. Absolutely. We almost go back and laugh. We're, yeah. We look at like some of the guys making relief appearances and you're like, I feel like that was five years ago. It was opening yeah. day. It's just, it's just typically how it goes. Our last question from Ethan Briggs in the spirit of the new scoreboard, which is just unbelievable. Ethan asked, you get to watch one sports movie on the new City Field scoreboard. What are we watching? Oh, man. Uh, I, I will hang out with Buck and we'll watch Draft Day because I know Buck. Oh, my draft God. Day. You so the I'll... worst sports movie of all time. <laughs> you, you managed to do it. No, no. Yeah, um, it's the worst uh, one. Yeah, Draft Day is pretty bad. Uh, that's that's actually a great question. Um, I, it is. I, I probably, it feels like for me, it has to be baseball because you're at City yeah, Field. Yeah, that's just what I was going like to say. I, it I, it's very baseball. chalky, but I would pick Moneyball. I really like Moneyball and, and think that it's a feel good baseball movie. And I'm I'm looking for that feel good baseball movie. So it's a very chalk pick, but it I, it's hard for me to answer any other way. Yeah, Moneyball, maybe Major League. Uh, those are kind of yeah. the two that jumped out. I, I was going to say Moneyball after I came back. So you, you stole that one from me. So Major League is probably my backup. Yeah. And then, like, honestly, a good substitute would be to watch the 86 Mets doc. I mean, yeah. like, at City Field, that would be pretty special. Sure, it's a couple parts long, but um, that would be very on brand as well. The scoreboard is just unbelievable. Like, I feel like I'm going to so walk nice. into City Field, and I feel like I'm in a totally different ballpark. All the renovations they made. All the right, yeah. right field is going to look totally different. The Mets are uh, the Mets are a big baller franchise these days. It's it's very enjoyable, Joe. And it's going to keep happening. I mean, year over year, they're just going to be adding more and more to the park. Yeah, so the, Joe Hayo, the, ball, the ballpark, the <laughs> pretty close. I mean, you know what we talk, you know, about the WBC. Like we we had talked about that a lot over the last few weeks, and. I called Japan way back before the WBC started, so I'll pat myself on the back that I hit on that. But, man, you how fun was it to see? I'll say, for all the things I've said about the WBC over the last week, the final was electric. That was so fun to watch. And, you know, seeing uh, Murakami hit a 450-foot home run and Otani and Darvish and Roki Sasaki the other night, too. Like, the last couple games were pretty electric. 
I just Japanese baseball culture. Let me say this, all of the different baseball cultures, especially like here, when you look at Miami, um, fit, like filled to the brim with the Puerto Rican and Dominican fans and how loud they are. Japanese baseball culture. It's, it's really special. You have this movie moment of Otani against Trout. It's truly like how any movie would end. It's the script. It's the script of sports. That's what everyone's saying now, right? Everyone's issued a script. That that was the script for the WBC. Otani finishing Trout to win it for Japan. That was it. I, and I'll close with this, show. I was not surprised, but when we finally got to see Otani win something, his intensity was like, I'm looking, I'm like, oh, like everything everybody says about him wanting to play for a contender in free agency is real. It's not just fluff. It's not just a ploy to get more money. That dude, we got to see him in a big moment. And not only is he built for the moment, but he relished in that kind of moment. 100%. So Dodgers, Mets, next offseason, the battle for Shohei Otani is upon us. It really is. And with that, we close out another show. The Turk Wendell episode, not Shark Teeth, Joe. Make a mental note. Next time <laughs> oh, we have God. Time, Next that time was, we have, it is great. That's that. That was great. And just ready to roll. I mean, yeah. he no holding back on that. It was not, awesome. Not a gimmick. Not no. For, yeah. If there's anything Turk Wendell is, it is authentic yeah. and genuine. You get no censor, no filter. It was awesome, man. So closing thoughts on our show as we not crawl, man. We're sprinting to opening day here pretty soon. Really excited week and a day. Uh, so here on Wednesday, so a week from tomorrow in Miami for opening day. Can't wait for it. And, you know, a, a couple shout outs to end the show. Last week was my, was my birthday. Today, Wednesday, it's my mom's birthday. So happy birthday to my mom. She watches the Mets pod every week. Uh, Love as to hear a support, it. Happy birthday as a, to your mom. As a supportive mother should. And a shout out to Connor, the man. Thank you, sir. Drop, drop, drop down the one knee and engaged him and Kristen really happy for you guys uh, thank you met, met her for the first time at the wild card game last year so i i couldn't get through this episode without congratulating my guy thank you dude it's awesome uh obviously we are huge mets fans so now we uh we're only a house divided by rangers and islanders our mets fandom continues we will be at city field a plenty and with you joe and with that thank you so much everybody one more reminder subscribe to the mets pod um, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch on SMYZ YouTube. And next week, we will be back with our supersized regular season preview. We have some big things planned for the pod this year uh, that we'll get to reveal in the weeks leading up. And, and just one more reminder so you never miss the announcement of whether it's events, special shows, special interviews. Just subscribe, and you'll get the notification right to your phone. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll catch you next week.